We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone to the third annual Summer Prevention Webinar Series. Um, this uh, is our third year doing this and we're really excited to be pr bringing this to you yet again. Um, again, it's something that we like to do in the summer because we know prevention educators can be really busy during the school year. Uh, so we like to provide this uh, opportunity in the summertime. Um, my name is Jesse Corcoran. I'm the Campus and Prevention Coordinator here at Wakasa, um, and I'll just sort of be your host today. Uh, just to let you know, today is the Sexual Assault to Prison Pipeline Realities and Recommendations uh, presentation that Game Changers from the Dane County RCC uh, are going to be providing for us today. Uh, just a quick note on some other topics that are in this series. Um, the rest, the other three uh, webinars are also on Mondays, 10 to 11.30 a.m. Um, on July 23rd, we have Zooming In, Poetry as an Entry Point into Violence Prevention Work. Um, we're really excited to be welcoming uh, the poet and artist and activist, Guante, uh, to do this webinar. Uh, you may have seen some of his poems go viral um, on, on uh, Facebook and YouTube and stuff like that. Um, you know, one of them, I think, was uh, 10 responses to the phrase man up, um, which I think was really a popular one. Um, on, on the 30th, we have how to talk to teens about sexting. Uh, we have a professor from, uh, or Amy Hassanoff uh, from the University of Colorado Denver, who's going to be presenting that one. And then on August 6th, we have Laura Zarate. Uh, she is the executive director of, let me make sure that I have the organization correct. Artisana, that's right. Um, she's a, also a Chicana victim advocate and bilingual training specialist. Um, and she's going to be talking about the impact of external and inter internalized misogyny on Latina survivors. A quick note also before we get started, um, I just want to direct you to the Wakasa webpage uh, for prevention. We do have a lot of resources on there. Um, what you see on the left is a consent toolkit. Uh, it's a lot of uh, consent resources, activities, images, things like that, uh, that you can be using in your any of your education and training on consent. Um, this was a toolkit that was put together by uh, several different partners who came together, including uh, End Abuse and DHS and Wakasa uh, and a lot of other partners that are listed in there as well. I also want to make note of the social norms toolkit. As you see on the right, we have our, our social norms that we have up there. Um, we really try to center our prevention work around these four social norms, and each one of these has a toolkit on our website as well that goes into more detail about each one of the social norms and how systems of oppression uh, continue to reinforce these social norms. Um, and one last thing, another other resources are us, right? Um, you can feel free to contact me or Kelly or Megan with any prevention questions you have. Um, if you're in need of resources, interested in getting training and things like that, you can also send us any feedback you have on the prevention webinar series. Uh, we really welcome your feedback because we want to make these uh, kinds of training opportunities as helpful and useful to you as possible. And finally, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, on your uh, GoToWebinar box, you'll see, uh, you'll probably have a question box or a chat box. It kind of depends what it's called on your particular screen, but you can use that to ask us any questions throughout the webinar. Um, we'll try to make sure that those get asked of the presenters as they come up. Um, we do recommend dial-in audio. Uh, it just seems to be a little bit more reliable than using computer audio. Um, but if you have any questions, you can also, or if you're having any problems, like some tech problems or audio problems, um, you can also use the chat or question box to ask those questions, and Peter will be able to, to lend a helping hand with that. Um, any other housekeeping things, Peter? No, I think you covered it. All right, great. Then I'm really excited to uh, turn it over to the Dane County RCC Game Changers. One moment while we switch presentations. Awesome, take Great. it away. Great. Well, first of all, I want to thank Wakasa for having us and inviting us to do this and just being a wonderful community partner. Um, my name is Heather Chun. I am the Prevention and Education Specialist at the Dane County Rape Crisis Center. Um, and I run the Game Changers program, uh, which is definitely my favorite part of my job. Um, and I'm lucky enough to be joined by three game changers, um, especially lucky because their appointment is technically only in the school year. So I want to say an extra big thank you to them for being here today and helping me prep this presentation. And I will let them introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Calista Stork. I recently graduated from La Follette High School. 
Hi, my name is Phoenix Borowski. I recently graduated from Wanakee High School. And my name is Eve Levy. I just graduated from Memorial High School. Awesome. All right, so a little background information on what the Game Changers is. Uh, so the Game Changers Youth Advisory Board is comprised of 16 Dane County High School students. Um, kind of main goals of the program are commitment to empowering youth to engage in activism, change the culture of sexual violence, and foster progress across Dane County. Um, particip participants work together to educate themselves and their fellow board members about various aspects of activism. Um, focusing on some of the root causes of rape culture and then later addressing these issues through projects and presentations to community members. Um, the Game Changers this year did an amazing job of that. So I'm actually currently working on kind of retooling uh, the Game Changers program. So some things that we'll be focusing on in the future, uh, topics like student rights and Title IX, Black Lives Matter, social justice centered political engagement and processes, media literacy, LGBTQ plus issues, and legal advocacy. Um, from this slide, you can see some of the projects that we did this year, the policy summit when Game Changers talked to a group of community members, including school administrators and legislators, um, about what we can be doing to make survivors feel safer in schools and make basically our community more trauma informed. Um, we were also lucky enough to meet with Representative Chris Taylor and um, kind of talk about the status of sexual sexual education um, in Madison Public Schools. Um, that was really awesome. And then a few of our game changers also uh, spoke at Wakasa's Rep around the Capitol, and it was wonderful. Um, just want to emphasize that. Um, Game Changers is uh, an appointed position that people go through um, a hiring process for, but really at the heart of our program, we're focusing on activism and emphasizing that, I mean, the leaders of tomorrow are already here and there are wonderful students um, and working with them, they're incredible, incredibly brilliant and they've honestly inspired me a lot for how I want to teach activism and some of the root causes of rape culture in the future. Um, if any of you have anyone that you think would be good um, as a game changer, um, the application is officially open for the 2018 to 2019 season. Um, again, this is something that you apply for, um, are interviewed, and then hopefully ultimately chosen. Um, but it's nice because it is a paid position. Um, we also pay you for travel, always feed you. Um, if you need childcare, we can absolutely help with that. Um, so, again, if this sounds like you or someone that you know, um, definitely feel free to email me um, at the address on screen, or if you Google Rape Crisis Center Game Changers, it will come up. So, on that note, I'm going to pass it along to the students. Thank you so much. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about the sexual assault prison pipeline. And now that automatic or that ultimately stems from the school to prison pipeline. So first we're going to give you a little bit of background on that so that we can kind of expand upon it and show how that's related to the sexual assault prison pipeline. So the school to prison pipeline is essentially school disciplinary policies that disproportionately affect black students. So basically what that means is that there are systems in place that are punishing black students um, more for the same violations. So they're getting punished more so than white students for you know, breaking these same rules. So one of these systems is, or an example of one of these systems is zero tolerance policies, which result in black students facing disproportionately harsher punishment than white students in public schools. And now, Black students also represent 31% of school-related arrests. And even though that is less than half, it's not proportionate to the percentage of um, black students that there are in schools. So if a school is, say, 17% black, then a higher percentage is going to be involved in these arrests, essentially. So another statistic about this is that black students are suspended and expelled three times more than white students. And 
these students who are suspended or expelled for discretionary violation, they're nearly three times more likely to be in contact with the juvenile justice system the following year. So essentially because black students are being suspended and expelled at much higher rates, it means they're also coming into contact with these juvenile justice systems at higher rates as well. And I know personally that I've seen these things happening in my school. I personally, I'm white and it has happened to me many times that I'll be walking down the hall and there will be a black student maybe 10 feet in front of me. You know, it'll be during class and, you know, for all, or essentially it'll be during class and a um, security guard or a staff member will, you know, ask that student where they're going, what they're doing, they'll say nothing to me. And while that may not seem like a huge deal, it kind of highlights a much bigger issue and that these students are being targeted more so. And I don't know, would you guys agree? Yeah, I also have another example um, that happened to me just a couple of months ago, right before I graduated. Um, a friend and I were letting another student into the school during school hours, which is currently a suspendable offense because um, they took new safety precautions after some issues at La Follette. Um, and my friend was black and I am white and she received an in-school suspension and I was sent back to class, um, even though we did the exact same thing. And the security officer that, you know, decided on that was white. And I think that that's one of the most like real examples that I've ever encountered, mm -hmm. just like straight up discrimination because of the color of our skin. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to add? Wanakee is a predominantly white community, and so the fact that we do have a pretty small African-American community in my school, I think, is definitely well known. Um, just with people of color, generally in our school, there aren't very many of them. So I would have to say that many stereotypes um, students hold true in their own hearts in our school, which is really unfortunate, and they like to be biased and stereotyped. The people of color that we do encounter on our everyday lives and everyday basis. But unfortunately, I don't have any examples like Calista and Eve have, but I can say that generally the white students that I've gone to school just assume that because someone is African American or because someone is Latina that they are going to be a violent or they're going to not care about their academics in their school, which is just another reason that shows that our society is so dead set against helping people of color. Um, break free of these barriers that we put on them and the chains that we hold them to. So I think it's just really frustrating that in every school across the nation that we're seeing people being treated disproportionately just because of the way they look. Mm -hmm. Okay, so ultimately what the school to prison pipeline tells us is that educational and penal institutions are systematically targeting students of color. And this is a clear example of institutional racism and oppression. And so now we're going to move into the sexual assaults prison pipeline, which hopefully you will see the connection between the two. So now that we've got some of the background on what the um, school to prison pipeline is, we can dive more into what the sexual assault to prison pipeline is, which is a cycle in which girls who experience sexual abuse are routed into the juvenile prison system as a result of their victimization. Something I also want to add is that it doesn't only affect girls, it affects people of all genders all races, all backgrounds, um, but the highest population that is affected are women, and so we usually use the she pronoun, she, her, hers pronouns. Um, so behavioral policies and academic institutions negatively impact sexual assault survivors and disproportionately affect minority students and students of color. Some examples of that are students with disabilities are 12% of the population, but 25% of them are referred to law enforcement. Another example is black students are 3.8 times more likely to be suspended than white students. And a final example, one district suspended 44.7% of its Native American students in 2009 to 2010. Girls of color account for approximately 22% of the general youth population, but comprise approximately 66% of girls who are incarcerated. This again, is an example of how institutional and impress ooh, institutional oppression and racism are deeply rooted within the penal and the judicial systems. Like progressing. 
to know is that more than 80% of girls in some states' juvenile detention centers have suffered from sexual or physical abuse before they were incarcerated. More on zero tolerance policies is that students with just one suspension were at 68% higher risk of dropping out of school than those students who had not been suspended. And a zero tolerance policy requires school officials to hand down specific, consistent, and harsh punishments, usually suspension or expulsion, when students break certain rules. The punishment applies regardless of the circumstances, the reasons for the behavior, like self-defense, or the student's history of discipline problems. That's why some critics call these policies one strike and you're out. Sexual assault in schools can affect women in many negative ways. When schools fail to support victimized girls, the girls may no longer feel safe in the school and as a result may disengage, become truant, or act out. In turn, they are disciplined and punished instead of looking at the root causes of these behaviors. Human trafficking is also a huge problem in our society. Trafficked youth are too young to consent to sex and thus are victims of sexual violence. When the prison system arrests trafficked youth rather than the traffickers, they send a message that the victim is to blame. So this next visual on the screen, we really wanna emphasize as this is the cycle of abuse and the cycle that really happens when you enter this vicious cycle that um, occurs because of an assault that women generally face um, before they enter the system. So I'm gonna read this off and go into depth just so that we can understand this together. So I just wanna explain the center part real quick. So girls' common reactions to trauma are criminalized and exacerbated by involvement in the juvenile justice system leading to a cycle of abuse and imprisonment, which I'm gonna explain real quick for you. So the starting point, as you can see on the screen here, is the little pink part on the right. And so I'm going to read that out loud. And that's the sexual abuse. So this is the root cause, the root action of the trauma that someone's experiencing. So this is really the starting point and the point that sets this whole cycle off. And so from there, we move on to unaddressed trauma, mental health, and physical health issues. Because as we know, if we face abuse that goes unresolved or unhelped, um, we generally face the aftermath of that. And unfortunately, a lot of these girls and a lot of these victims are left to deal with this on their own, which then later on um, leads to their entering of the cycle. And so because of this unaddressed trauma, we're leading to reactive behavior. So this is people acting out because of the issues that they've faced and like their feelings that they're having, they have nowhere left to turn. So in, um, that leads them to do some things that they probably wouldn't do normally. And then from there, we move into the entry of the juvenile justice system. And this generally stems from that reactive behavior, whether it be some criminal offense or them acting out in a school, whether it be um, either of these things, just the fact that they're facing uh, disciplinary action for something that they didn't want to receive or didn't ask to receive is the really hard, hard truth that we're facing here. And from that, we move to trauma symptoms. And trauma symptoms stem from unresolved trauma and then feeling more abuse and more actions received later on in life. So this all just piles up on one another until it gets to be something that people can't deal with on their own anymore. And then after this trauma symptoms, after these trauma symptoms are triggered, um, generally these girls and these victims and these survivors are released back into the community with unresolved problems and they're untreated for what they're facing and they have nowhere left to turn. So generally they turn to trauma coping behaviors or they return back to the criminal justice system because they don't know how to face what they're facing alone and they don't have the tools that they need to figure out how to get help with what they're going through because the criminal justice system obviously has not been the right place for them and without counselors and without strong uh, adult influences in their life, they're just returning to the cycle of abuse. And so then new arrest encounters and the cycle just continues and continues and continues until they're left in the criminal justice system alone and having to face what they're dealing with. So as you can see, it's really a circle. One thing leads to another and from there, it just keeps going and going. And this is a really hard truth that we have to face is that a lot of times sexual abuse is the reason that these girls are facing these issues in the first place which is why we focus so much on consent education and focusing on how to ensure that people in our community are educated on sexual assault 
because it's so unfortunate that look one thing such as a sexual assault could lead to a lifetime of institutionalization and someone's whole life is turned upside down for something that they didn't want to have happen to them. So we wanted to touch on this as well, that one in three girls in the youth justice system have been sexually abused. So that's a pretty scary number, just to think of how many girls are already in the justice system and that one in three of them have been sexually abused. It just goes to show that so many people have faced these issues and so many of them are ending up in the criminal justice system instead of treatment centers for getting help to face their trauma or helping them um, deal with their past and deal with their demons that instead they're just ending up in prisons, which is not really the right place for them at all. So we just wanted to touch on that and make sure that we emphasize this so we can see how scary the numbers really are. And I think it's also important to touch on the fact that this number could very well or is very well not always accurate because the reporting process is mm -hmm. so difficult for these survivors. So now we're going to talk about some of the gender injustices that come from um, childhood in girls' homes. So 45% of girls in the juvenile justice system had five or more adverse childhood experiences, also known as ACEs. Um, some examples of ACEs are emotional abuse, physical abuse, intimate partner violence, divorce, substance abuse, mental health problems in the house, um, so on and so forth. So another statistic to note is that girls experience sexual abuse at 4.4 times the rate of boys. Um, and as you can see, some of the other statistics, 31% of girls experience sexual abuse in their lifetimes. Um, and then these traumatic experiences in children's lives, girls' lives, often result in behaviors later in life, such as running away, poor relationships, um, substance abuse, school failure, things like that. And I have some examples from people I've met in my lifetime. Um, that really kind of show what these things can do to you. So one example is um, a child I know who was in kindergarten and had experienced sexual, physical, and emotional abuse in her household and had been acting out in school, which is very common. Um, and she was kept in the household where the abusers, there was two of them and where they both were. And her parent was incarcerated, one of them, which is another one, another ace. Um, and so we, she was in summer school. That's the reason I knew her because she'd failed school with school failure. Um, and she also had been suspended multiple times for touching other kids inappropriately, which is very common in young kids who have experienced sexual abuse. Um, and she was on the brink of getting expelled as well at the age of six. And from the beginning of her life, she was set up to fail and no one can help her. I spoke to many staff members at that school and they were at a loss. They didn't know what else to do. We would call every day to CPS, trying to get her out of the house and nothing was done. And everyone would say, well, we know where she's gonna end up in 10 years. And it is so, I don't know what the word is, but what? Disheartening. It's just disheartening and also, Everyone just assumes that this is what happens to these kids, whereas it shouldn't be assumed that that's what happens. It should be assumed that they're going to get help and they're going to grow from their experiences. But in all reality, they're probably not going to, and she's going to end up um, in this system of in and out of jail. Um, another example I have of a male is that one of my close friends experienced sexual abuse as a child, and due to their... Um, Latino culture. It's not often spoken about. They're not allowed to talk about it. Um, they never received the proper treatment for it. And they are still dealing with it now in ways that they don't even realize they're dealing with it. Um, something they've dealt with a lot of substance abuse. They drink a lot just to get to a place where they feel okay. And they feel very ashamed of what happened to them. And it definitely affected the way they view their sexuality, as is common with men that experience these types of situations. And they grew up thinking that it was something that just happened in life and something that was expected. Um, and I'm watching them experience so many things happening in their lives that they think are their own fault, but are actually the result of their trauma. Um, just want to reiterate what 
they've said so far that, again, this is not the fault of the survivors, like those reactionary behaviors. This is understandable for anyone that's experienced trauma, and unfortunately with school and the penal system's reaction to that can further traumatize students. So again, this is not their fault at all. It's the institutions and systems that have failed them. Um, just want to make that clear. Yeah. So some realities of these gender injustices are that from 1985 to 2013, formal court processing for girls increased 32%, and black girls were almost three times as likely as white girls to be, to be referred to court. And American Indian slash Alaska Native girls are 50% more likely to be detained. And another statistic, um, as you can see on the chart next to it, that I found was interesting is 76% of prostitution charges are against girls, um, which then restarts the process of, you know, victimizing these girls who have been brought into sex trafficking and whatnot against their will, mostly underage. And the ones that are, that should be getting in trouble are not, and they're still in the streets doing the things that they've always been doing. Generally, the girls are getting in trouble for something that they didn't ask to be brought into versus the person, uh, such as a pimp, who would be the one uh, using these girls against their will for these sexual actions. So these young girls are being faced with the consequences for a decision and an action that wasn't their own. And they've most likely become dependent on their John um, through their those experiences. And once they're released from jail, they're usually a felon. And it's easy to go back into those same habits and fall back into those people that have so much control over you and then end up right back in jail. Um, there's a question that came in. Um, does the one third of people incarcerated juveniles being sexually assaulted reflect people of color? Do you know? I think it's a general population. Um, so that would be my guess. Again, actually we're gonna link the report that that's from so you can have much more information um, about it. But I think that's again, largely like entire female prison population. Okay. And then when you say girls, do you mean females under 18? Yes. Um, and actually a clarification about that. So, and I think my, you guys like, so when we're talking about quote unquote prostitution for someone under the age of 18, is that really prostitution or is that forced sexual assault? I would argue that it's forced right, sexual assault right. again because yeah. someone under the age of 18, at least in Wisconsin, cannot legally consent. So anything that's happening with them is under coercion, which makes it not prostitution, it's assault. Right. Any other questions, Peter? Okay, thank you. Okay, so the sexual assault prisons pipeline has a significant um, impact on both the community and the individuals within that community. So specifically for the individuals, once they're inside this juvenile system, victimized girls encounter a system that's ill-equipped to identify and treat their trauma. So what Phoenix was talking about earlier with that cycle, you know, they are not in a mentally well state. And once they're in these systems, there's no way for them to get better. And this punitive environment also leads to new incidents of sexual assault. So one statistic about that is that one eighth of youth confined to a juvenile detention facility were victimized at the facility in the preceding year. And 80% of these were committed by staff. So this is a very, deep-rooted problem. It's not um, something that's just happening um, between people who are in the prisons. It's very systemic. And um, as far as the community, schools that fail to support victimized youth often see those students acting out, skipping classes, and engaging in destructive behaviors, which, you know, is creating this kind of negative environment. And also victimized girls who are punished for behavioral troubles, they're more likely to have altercations and interactions with law enforcement, which we can really relate to what Calista was talking about earlier in that um, these girls who are acting out, a lot of them, you know, we're not looking at the root of why they're acting out, which is in the end not gonna improve their behavior because we're not, treating, you know, whatever's going on in their own life that's causing them to act this way. Going off what Eve said about the individuals, too, um, as the victims enter the criminal justice system, 
they're being sent to a place where people are thinking there's going to be reform and they're being protected by the staff members there and that these are going to like help change them and fix these issues that they've gone through. But when 80% of the staff um, commit these kind of actions to these girls, they're further deepening this deep-rooted trauma that they've already ex experienced. And this just further continues the cycle because the very people that are supposed to protect them are the ones who are um, just hurting them even more. So it's really frustrating to see that our society as a whole thinks that these girls and these children are going to places where they're going to be protected and their issues are going to be faced, but instead they're just creating more trauma and more unaddressed issues for them to deal with later in life. And I think you see it a lot too with, um, I've seen numerous accounts of girls in my own school that have been victimized and the school continues to victimize them further and they stop coming to school because they don't feel safe there, they don't feel comfortable. The school allows other students to say terrible things. I've had girls come and tell me like they've been cornered in the bathroom, been told to kill themselves due to school, and then everyone can see that you're dead and like things like that that are just god awful to say to another human being. And that is something that destroys you for the rest of your life. And these girls, they had so much that could have happened in their life, so many bright things in their future, but they stopped showing up to school. They stop caring about these things because they don't feel safe. Mm -hmm. When the zero tolerance policies are enacted and when those are in place and you are acting out because something deep, deeply awful and so terrible has happened to you and we're not looking at why you did something and you're just looking at that something happened, this just further punishes these, these girls and these children for doing something that they didn't want to do or they didn't ask to have happen to them. So it's really frustrating to see that schools um, aren't a place where children can feel safe and aren't a place that students can oftentimes receive help, but are instead places where students are just being further victimized and putting being put through further trauma, which is really unfortunate. And I think growing up, we, um, at least in my life, I was taught that things like school, government officials, police officers, things like that are safe people they want and they want to help right. you. And so one of the hardest things to realize, I think, in my life was that that's not the case most of the time. And to learn that at such a young age is awful. You have this mistrust, and then if you're put into the um, juvenile justice system, you're not going to trust anyone there, and most people aren't out to help you. Mm -hmm. Simply locking these girls up is only worsening their trauma, right? I think is ultimately what we're trying to say. So moving on, we're going to talk about how this whole idea connects to rape culture. Um, so. First off, victim blaming, which is again, the idea that we're not exploring the root of why these kids are doing what they're doing. We're just saying, oh, they're bad kids, they're acting out, we need to lock them up, punish them, et cetera. So an example of this is when a youth is being sex trafficked, often they can be arrested for, prostitu for prostitution charges, but the traffickers are not, there's no punishment for them. And it sends the message that violence towards these girls is okay, or that um, it's these girls' fault that they got themselves involved in this situation. And then another way that this connects to rape culture is acceptance of violence. And so when victimized students are subjected to suspension, expulsion, or referred to law enforcement for challenging behavior rather than being supported, it sends the message that in the eyes of the school, they're criminals which is even more damaging to their mental state and in the end is not going to help them improve upon their behavior and become mentally well. Like what we keep saying, you know, we can't blame these survivors for acting out because there are reasons behind what they're doing that is beyond their control. It's a normal human reaction to have fight or flight instincts. And if your instinct is to lash out because something horrendous has happened to you. You can't punish a child because of that. You have to try to understand what's happened to them. And I think that's really hard too, is that we know that there are a lot of good people out there that are trying to reach out to these students and trying their best to help them, but there are systems in place that doesn't allow them to do so. As Calista was saying earlier, when they were trying to help that one girl get out of her abusive home and just everything was working against them, it's so hard to help people when our system isn't set up to assist. And I think that's something that we wanted to t focus on as well, is that we can try our best as individuals to help these people, but as a society and as a system, we need to break this cycle because until we can 
as a whole figure out what to do to better understand and better assist these individuals, then we're just going to be stuck in the cycle continuously. Yeah, and with the little girl we are speaking of, she has been raised that to think that her body is not her own and she is not in control of her body. And she is Latina and that's the judicial system is going to have no mercy against her as she gets older. And no one is going to be on her side when she gets older. So it has to start young with those kids. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not just about fighting the system, it's about changing it. Right. So we wanted to offer some recommendations as well, some real ideas for how we can change the system and how we can better it for the future and um, to hopefully ensure that the people who are needing help can hopefully one day get the help that they do need. So one of the main points we wanted to touch on was to stop criminalizing behavior caused by damaging environments that are out of students' control. To be a little bit more specific about that is we don't want to punish students for having an abusive home life or for having absentee parents or lacking a parental figure at all. Or, you know, there's so many kids that are growing up in situations that we can't even begin to imagine. So many students that don't have a two-parent home to go home to or even a home at all. So it's just we have to understand what these students are going through and that their actions might be a cry for help instead of them just acting out to act out. And so one of the ways that we can help these students is to decriminalize offenses common to students living in traumatic social contexts. So again, that just reiterates the fact that if students are living in a less than ideal home situation, which they probably are if they are acting out, then to ensure that they're not being treated as if that's their fault. Because it's no student or child's fault that their home life isn't what it deserves to be. And we also need to ensure that proper police training on how to respond supportively to students in need instead of punitively. I think that especially um, police liaison officers that are in schools need to understand how to connect with students. And they need to understand how students work and how warning signs can often bring up deeper rooted issues. And we can't just have. It says we're muted. Oh. Okay, we're good. Okay, sorry. <laughs> But we can't just like have police officers seen as a big scary force that's in a school to punish you. We want these officers to be able to connect with students and be able to support them with the law, especially if they need help in that sense. We also want to treat sexually exploited youth as survivors and victims by decriminalizing prostitution for minors. And as Heather touched on earlier, that if you're under 18, prostitution is not prostitution, but um, for sexual assault because you must have been coerced because as we know, the age of consent in Wisconsin is not until you're 18. So any age under that, it is not legal consent. So we wanna make sure that these students are being protected and these children are being taken care of. We also wanna revise school policies to support students in need, limiting school-based arrests and court referrals. Um, oftentimes entering the legal system seems like the easiest option of how to quote unquote deal with a student or fix a student's problems when in reality this is just going to create more problems and the system of abuse and continuation just keeps on going because if you show a student that you don't want to work with them and you're not willing to put in the effort required to help them and help them change and you just continue to push them into the justice system things are not going to get better because they're going to see that no one no one cares about them and no one is rooting for them and we all need people in our life that want to be our advocate and want to be our ally and just pushing kids into the justice system does not help them to realize that and i think um i want to go back to the proper police training like the police officers that are in schools i think something i would really appreciate seeing more is um more like survivor based language um a lot of the interactions i've seen in my school at least, have been very anti-survivor. They've uh, supported the abuser because um, often they're both in the same school. And the um, we've had some really kind of not great situations where the school officers are not helping at all and working to cover and um, help out the abuser, which is awful and sends so many terrible messages to the survivor. And um, I know a lot of teachers have come to me asking for tools, how do I help if I see something happen? How do I help if a student 
confides in me because as a teacher, your mandate is a reporter and all you're meant to do is report it to a social worker, so on and so forth. You don't really do much more than that. Um, but I know most teachers want to do more because they know that not much else is going to be done from higher up and they feel they have more of a voice as an adult in the building. And so I think something that we should work on too is starting from there, giving teachers the resources they want and that they need um, to help students. Um, I want to echo that. I um, work at several different schools in the Madison area. And again, I think it's teachers and other like base staff that do really want to help. They just haven't been equipped with the correct tools. Also want to shout out teachers. They don't make enough money for the amazing things that they do. They have so many things to deal with. So RCC is um, always trying to equip them with tools that they can um, implement into their already existing structures because it's not fair for us to say, do all these things with no time. But again, this is really important and I think most teachers would take time to attend a training, read a toolkit, things like that. Yeah, we don't want to make it sound as if all school employees are the worst and that they're out to get students. Yeah. But in our experiences, oftentimes the people who are supposed to be the ones helping us have let us down. And we know that's not true in every social situation or every school environment. But um, I think it's easier to focus on the amount of bad things that could happen from one person than the amount of good. Because we know there are good people out there, but it's just most people aren't equipped to deal with these things and we recognize that. And we want to ensure that you know that we are here for you. And like Heather said, there is training out there to help you deal with this too, because this isn't an easy thing for anyone. This is going to take time and effort to change. But we want to know that everybody is here to help. And like students want to be able to talk to you and students want to be able to approach their teachers. Students don't like to have to spend time disliking their students just like, or their teachers, just like teachers don't like spending time disliking their students, you know? Mm -hmm. So we wanna make sure that there's just like an open uh, path of communication and that students and teachers and administrators and faculty in general can just all work together to help end this cycle of abuse. I have a quick question for students. If you see schools react in, or just the student body sees the school react in a negative way, even to just one situation, do you think that makes it harder for other students to come forward? Definitely. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so for that, sure. that yeah. creates a really difficult culture. And on yeah. the flip side, if you see like a safe person, such as a teacher, like do something really awesome, do you think that will help yeah. like encourage others? I think it does, but I think there's just a very general attitude of, among teachers in my school. Um, I can't speak for all, obviously, mm -hmm. but in my school that um, when these things happen, the teachers care and they want to help, but they have little to no faith in the people above them mm -hmm. um, because of their, the disproportionate amount of cases that have gone um, gone poorly and have sided with the abusers. So I think that like throughout the school, there's no trust in higher up. Uh, we had a question that yeah. came in. <clears throat> um, the person said, one challenge to decriminalizing offenses common to students living in traumatic social contexts is that some students may act out by assaulting others. I would want to ensure that students who are assaulted by other students have an opportunity for justice, even if their assailant lives in a traumatic context. Yes, that's absolutely valid. Um, and unfortunately, we know that it's common that um, students that are acting out, especially in a violent way, often have violence in their past. So we absolutely don't want to imply that a per anyone that hurts another person shouldn't face consequences. We just want a more restorative justice process. And in that, we want to protect, both, like we want to protect the survivor from being in the same spaces as their um, perpetrator. So yes, thank you for saying that. Absolutely, there does need to be follow-up. Um, there needs to be better justice for survivors, especially in schools, um, because they have some of the least resources available to them. But again, we want a more restorative justice aspect. And again, the four of us aren't experts on this. I know I'm guessing there are many other ways to do that, right. and I'm not even sure what those are. We just can't have it the way that we have it. Right, right. kind of just the, you know, the zero tolerance, yeah, the zero not even looking at what the background is. Um, and obviously, we would hope that schools are following Title IX policies and protecting the survivor, um, which is another thing that often we don't see upheld in schools, which I think causes a lot of survivors to be uncomfortable, thus resulting in them skipping school, 
falling into that cycle again. And actually, there is a class at my school that students can take that's called restorative justice. And it looks at um, different ways that we can kind of work to um, heal and improve upon students' behavior that isn't just uh, suspending them, expelling them, them ending up in jail. Um, so there are a lot of ways, and I haven't taken the class, a lot of my friends have taken the class, but you know, they tell me about it, and there are a lot of ways that we can kind of work to, you know, get justice for everybody, but in a restorative way, so that there's not, you know, there's not like, nobody's ending up in a very bad situation because of stuff that has happened to them. So there are a lot of um, ways that, you know, people are working on to try and, yeah. you know, combat the, like, um, people being assaulted and then saying, oh, well, you know, it's, it's not their fault that they assaulted that person, you know. Yeah. So. But we, um, Game Changers and RCC and Wakasa, again, we will always stand with survivors. Right. Um, again, mm -hmm. we're just trying to fix a system right. so that survivors can have a better and easier yeah. time. It's not easier, but like actually have the yeah. tools to heal. And going back to the little girl I was speaking of earlier, she um, had gotten suspended for touching other students, which is yeah. assault. And um, it's easier to think of a child not understanding what they're doing um, and understanding that these are the results of the things that have happened in their lives, but it's the same type of process when you're older. Um, granted, you have more knowledge of what you're doing, um, so obviously the process is different, but remembering that it would be unfair to put this child in jail for doing something that she's not conscious of why she's doing it and that she's been taught is okay. Mm -hmm. So that's some much larger societal yeah. attitudes that we need mm -hmm. to change too. Right. Okay, continuing along, we have some more recommendations as for what we believe are some of the best ways that we can go about fixing the system that we have. So we want to include and engage students and families throughout the juvenile justice system. And I think the hard thing, too, is that when a student truly does need to be entered in the juvenile justice system, um, oftentimes families don't know what that means. They don't know what consequences that's going to have, and they don't know what the aftermath of that will actually be. And even when these children and these girls are entered into the system, we want to ensure that their families and supporting members of their lives understand what's going to be happening to them. Because I think oftentimes there's a disconnect between um, enforcement officers and these students with a conversation. And so a lot of times, especially um, the disproportionate amount of people of color going into these systems, um, they need to understand like what's happening. And many times, like Callista was saying, one of her friends was Latino and he had experienced sexual assault. Many times these families don't understand the American system and even we don't understand it ourselves. But we need to ensure, especially if there's a language barrier or a cultural barrier, that people are understanding what's happening and that this just isn't a wake-up call one morning where someone says, oh, look, we're taking your child away from you and we're not going to explain why. So we need to ensure that there's an open line of communication where things are being really explicit and explained. And we don't want to detain students for offenses and technical violations who pose no threat to public safety. So I think this is a really big one, especially if someone's behavior um, or acting out isn't them physically assaulting other students, that we need to take a closer look at what's going on. Because a lot of times when people are acting out on their trauma or their experiences, it's not so obvious. Um, it's more the drug abuse or the substance abuse or the missing school or the missing assignments. It's not some one big, uh, you know, like fight or something like that. It's a lot of little things. So we don't want to punish these students for trying to give warning signs for the fact that they need help and they need someone to reach out and be there for them. We also want to use trauma-informed approaches to prevent further harm. And what we mean by this is we want to ensure that students and staff alike are informed about 
what trauma could be present and like what trauma in general is, because I think a lot of the times it is really sexual assault is a stigmatized issue to talk about. It still is. And that's an unfortunate truth and an unfortunate reality that we have to face. But we want to make sure that prison staff and school staff are aware of what trauma can be caused from an experience such as this. And a lot of times it's really hard if you haven't been through a similar similar situation to kind of wrap your brain around what this person might be going through, but we have to try to understand. So we want to give the give people the tools and the resources that they need to ensure that they can connect with these students and connect with these kids on a more personal and deeper level. And some of the last recommendations that we have to um, develop and support alternative restorative justice. And so this can look like a lot of different things, but we don't want the automatic reaction, the automatic um, consequence for students' actions to be suspension, expulsion, or entrance into the justice system. We want to see more uh, therapeutic approaches, such as talking to a counselor or getting someone into maybe a different living situation, things such as this that can change their life for the better instead of the probable worse. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt you for one second. Um, I just want to shout out the YWCA's um, in Madison have a wonderful youth restorative justice program. So if you're looking for an example of what that might mm -hmm. look like, mm -hmm. um, the YWCA um, in Madison, Wisconsin has great resources for that. Yeah, Eve, sorry. Eve, um, yeah, no, I just wanted to say uh, one method of restorative justice that I just wanted to mention um, a lot of times when students um, are, you know, acting out, they'll be asked to do something that helps their community or gets them involved. So maybe it's not necessarily something that they want to do, mm -hmm. but it's something that they are asked to do and people check in with them, see how it's going. So maybe they'll, you know, help, they'll volunteer with, um, some, just as an example, like some disabled kids in their community, or, you know, they'll do something to help out. So hopefully it's actually going to set them on a better path. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We also want to support and fight for increased funding for prevention programs that address health needs related to trauma. So it's really important to focus on mental health in these situations as well, because trauma often brings about mental health issues and we all know that mental health is a really hot button issue with everybody and especially these trauma survivors and these victims of abuse. We wanna ensure that there are programs and prevention in place so that before something happens, we can hopefully get to them, but if we can't, then afterwards that there are options for them. And so many times people are dealing with demons that they don't even know that they have or that people haven't even been able to recognize with them them. So we want to make sure that there are systems in place to help support these people and give them what they need, really. And our main emphasis really is just to treat survivors and all students with compassion for their humanity. At the end of the day, we're all people and we've all been through things, some worse than others. But we want to ensure that just because you say something that's bad or you've seen something that's different, we don't want to treat you like an outsider or treat you like something's wrong with you. We want to ensure that we're treating people with compassion and that we're treating these people with justice and we're letting them speak their truth and we're trusting survivors as something has happened to them and that's a terrible thing and we want to ensure that their future isn't broken because of that thing. So just another quick visual for you all. Girls should never be criminalized for being victims of abuse and violence. Stop the prison pipeline. And this is another thing, or it's not just girls, we're aware of that, but we want to make sure that we emphasize that girls are disproportionately the ones being uh, admitted to the cycle of abuse and admitted to the sexual assault prison pipeline. So one of the final things that we want to talk about is the Centoya Brown case. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, but in case you are not, it is a girl who was, um, when she was 16 years old, she killed her John um, because she thought he was reaching for a gun, and she was given life in prison at the age of 16 years old. She was tried as an adult, um, and 
many celebrities have taken to social media to talk about this case and her receiving justice. Um, I believe she's now 29 years old and she has been like an upstanding prison inmate. She received an associate's degree while in prison. Um, and just again, she was only 16 years old and had been trafficked from an even younger age, um, been drugged and repeatedly raped by multiple men. Um, and these injustices occur all of the time. And being arrested reinforces these ideologies put into survivors' minds that it's their fault and that institu these institutions don't care about them. Um, and so, again, it's another example of there is race, racial undertones, or maybe they're not even undertones. They're just like, you know, <laughs> they're just there. They're just <laughs> highlights. Yeah. Um, and there's, you can even look at like the Brock Turner case. I know there's like things on the internet that have been compared to this, like how he raped a woman and got you know, like negative six months in jail and um, how this girl was fighting in self-defense and reacting in a very human way um, to save her own life and was given life in prison and no option for parole until I believe she's 69 years old. Um, and I know currently the prosecutor who was in charge of this case still stands by his decision and doesn't think that she should be given clemency or even a reduction in her sentence. Um, and I know that the voting has been pretty close as well. Some people still really believe that she should be incarcerated, um, despite the fact that she's already been in jail for a significant amount of time. And at the age of 16, you are a child. And if you're interested in hearing about more similar cases to this, I would recommend reading the book Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson. He kind of dives really deep into this issue. He's done a lot of work with um, similar cases. He's a lawyer as well, and um, just a recommendation. Yeah, and if you want to find um, more information on Centoya's case, you can go to YouTube and just type in Sentencing Children, um, Centoya's story, and you can watch more on that. And if you want to learn more, uh, you can go to the Human Rights Project for Girls, Georgetown Law Center on Poverty and Inequality, and the Miss Foundation for Women combined to produce this invaluable resource. Um, to learn more about this topic, this report is a great place to start, as well as finding what's around in your communities, um, or even just starting conversations about it, just so people have this in the back of their heads. They're talking about it. They're bringing it up to people that have the power to change things. We want to ensure that people know that this is happening everywhere. It's not just a big city thing is happening in our community, it's happening in communities across the country. And there needs to be a dialogue about it. And there isn't right now. And that's the unfortunate truth that we have to face. And what we have to deal with is that um, we have to start a conversation about this. And we have to make sure that people are aware that this is happening. Because we think one of the main issues is that a lot of times educators and law enforcement alike aren't super aware of this issue. And they aren't aware of the own like implicit biases that they hold true. And until we can start thinking about these things and start bringing um, some light to these cases and these issues in general, like nothing's gonna change, which is why we're so glad that you all have tuned in today and listened to us and yeah. I think, mm -hmm. thank my students, they've made me proud as always. Anything else? Um, well, we can uh, take this moment to uh, open it up to folks. Um, if anybody has any more questions about the sexual abuse to prison pipeline, um, or any of the questions for the game changers and the work that they do, um, please feel free to start entering those now. Um, could I ask again, what was the name of the website about Centoya Brown? It was just a YouTube, there's something on YouTube that you can look up if you just look oh, up. Oh, okay. Here, I can go back to the slide. I was just gonna provide a, I was just gonna provide yeah. a link. For there is a here. link um, underneath there. Oh, okay, yeah. oh, children. gotcha, okay, yep. great. Awesome. And I provided a little link to the book, Just Mercy, um, in the chat as well. But um, are there any other questions? Um, I'm not seeing any others entered right now. And again, my contact information is on this, um, in this, in these slides. So if you did have any like follow-up questions, totally happy to answer them that way. Um, oh, we do have a question. Oh, we do have a question. Yep. Uh, do you have suggestions for how teachers can run their classes to better support all students' learning and participation, especially students who are living in trauma? Yeah, so we've actually created a 
toolkit for teachers to um, talk about these issues and it's kind of just a general toolkit to help them better teach sexual education. Um, but we also cover how to talk to students who have faced trauma in that. Um, is there a way that we could like link that? Um, yes. Where would I find that? Um, it's still in the process of being produced. Okay. Um, but when we do have it in its final form, I can pass it along to Jesse, and we can make that available somehow. Um, and I think one of the most important things, like my mom is a teacher, and she works a lot with students that come from traumatic backgrounds, and one of the most important things is just letting them know that they're cared for mm -hmm. because they don't think they are. And sometimes one-on-one -on -one is the only way you can break through to students. And my mom has had so many breakthroughs with students through that. And these kids won't listen to anyone else but her because she's given the time of day to listen to them and understand what they're going through. And um, she works in an elementary school and their brains work in ways that they don't understand. And they don't know what they need and they don't know why these things are happening, why they're acting the way they're acting. And so um, for her, just listening and understanding and them seeing that my mom cares and seeing someone that's proud of them, proud of the progress they're making has helped immensely. And just knowing that they have even that one person has helped them, um, their behavior in schools. And I know that that's not a teacher's job necessarily to like have those connections but most teachers really try to build those and I know that personally those have helped me so much just um, help me focus in school help me um, feel more comfortable talking to teachers asking for help when I need it because I know that some of these teachers genuinely care about me and my well-being yeah like Calista my dad was an educator for over 10 years and he's now a high school principal and he uh, worked in a high school, he was a high school history teacher, but I think the connections that Calista's mom is able to make with the younger students are so important because he was seeing students later in life when it was really hard to connect with them and it was really hard to break through if something like that hasn't um, been available to them from a younger age. But I know for him at least, he just tries to be understanding and he he doesn't push students to explain their life story to him. And I think that's one of the hard things, too, is you want to be able to relate to what someone's going through and you want to understand. But sometimes you just need to take a step back and see it from their eyes. And you don't want to push students to share information with you that they're not ready to share. But you want to let them know that you are supporting them and you're there if they ever need you. And I know today he still goes out to lunch with past students he's had in his classes and he still makes time and effort to see these kids because they've impacted his life just as much as he's impacted theirs. And it's just being cognizant of the fact that your students in your classes look up to you, like you're there as a mentor figure to them. And just because someone is differently abled or they may have a sexuality that you don't yet understand, that doesn't mean that you should treat them any differently because of that. You want to be supportive and you want to listen and you want to take the time to be there for that student. And that might be in a different capacity for each student. It might be listening and offering advice for students, but it also might just be giving your students space because that might be what they need. So it's just recognizing that each of your students is special and unique in their own way, and so are you, and you have that ability to be there for those students or to just offer a, like a, a listening ear. So right. teachers are really capable of doing so much, and so we appreciate the fact that you're willing to try to be there the best that you can be. Yeah, and I know a lot of my teachers um, at the beginning of the school year, they would give out like these kind of like surveys about yourself and be like, is there anything you want to tell me about mm -hmm. yourself, how you deal with stress, how you deal with these things, and um, I think those are really helpful too because it just gives you an opportunity not to say that X, Y, and Z have happened in my life, but if I'm having a day, this is what I want you to do, this is what I need from you. And the teachers genuinely respect those things. Yeah. And they know, like, you can just say it to some of my teachers, like, yep, I'm going through it today. Like, today is just not my day. And they are like, okay, well, here, go do this. I'll leave you alone. Deal with it. If you need anything, I'm here. If you need to go see a counselor, let me know. Whatever you need. And I think that that's really great because they respect you. They respect you. Um, as an adult, they don't try to pry. They don't try to, you know, do more than they should but they just respect what you need. Mm -hmm. um, as a prevention educator, I can add a few kind of larger umbrella things. Um, using survivor-centered language and making it clear that your classroom is a safe place um, to talk about difficult things and that they're always gonna be believed. 
Um, that's a really important thing. Again, open communication and having a way for students to tell you their needs. I think a lot of the times adults um, view students as not their own capable autonomous people and students are very smart and they know what they need a lot of times. Um, listening to that, honoring that, um, and also things like using gender inclusive language mm -hmm. and resources that are diverse, again, um, can help students feel more included and that their experiences are valid. I would also say if you're um, a teacher that's specializing in a, a subject where you might be either reading something that involves sexual assault or rape or talking about, um, I mean, for example, our country's history <laughs> um, and how it was founded. Um, those are times that it's going to be really important before you even start discussing something to kind of issue a trigger warning saying, hey, we're going to be talking about some difficult things. If you can outline kind of what some of those things are, again, making it a safe place um, if students do want to be vulnerable and talk about it. And then I would say the last big one is being aware of uh, kind of cultural trauma. And again, that's very personal, um, but again, just being aware of big trends within our history that are still, that again, our bodies are still carrying um, to this day. So remembering those things, being inclusive and above everything else, honoring student experience, because again, they know what they need. They're incredibly smart and they want to heal and do well. Yeah, I think the whole idea of trigger warnings is a big one that um, I wish, you know, teachers at my school had been more in tune with because in our English classes and other classes as well, we're asked to read a lot of really difficult material. I think you guys would probably agree that can include very like graphic um, sexual assault or other sorts of um, incidences of abuse and they really don't warn us at all. And I think for a lot of kids who maybe face some of this, that can be a really difficult for them and it's part of their grade right. and it's not fair to them that they're being forced to do this in order Almost to relive their trauma exactly yes. and again in order it's, a, it's a sense school. of loss of control again because you're being put into a situation that you didn't ask to be in mm -hmm. yeah i know for instance calista has actually given a presentation yeah. to <laughs> her english class i know yeah. i helped her with presentation um and Again, that was beautiful that you could do that. But again, if that teacher had been like trained and given the tools right. to do that, they could have done it themselves and have been doing it for the entire time. And with the themselves. that staff member that asked me to give the presentation, um, it was after she'd gotten numerous um, complaints, I suppose, from other students, citing that it was really hard for them to read that, um, which is hard to tell a teacher, but. I'm so happy they did because I don't think she realized that that was something that was hard for students mm -hmm. to read. And so she asked me to come in and just kind of talk about it, um, talk about what was coming up. And it's things like that that teachers just aren't aware of that they need right. to be, yeah. you know, providing yeah. resources for. Why we need more resources right. and tools and, you know, we just want to get teachers more money. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't look like there are any other questions. Um, so I just want to take a moment to thank our game changers uh, from Dane County RCC for being here. Um, I know I always feel much more uh, optimistic about the future when I when I hear young people talking about these things. Um, so, and I, more optimistic about the present, for the record. <laughs> um, I was actually just in a space where people kept talking about young people and they're like, oh yeah, we can't wait till you guys are 30 and doing this work and it's like but they're doing the work now <laughs> like your leaders now like I, it's not we're not waiting for anything it's happening now so thank you so much um, so just a reminder um, we do have another webinar next week uh, Guante uh, is going to be uh, presenting on uh, poetry and activism so uh, and looking towards collective change so um, please uh, if you're interested in the rest of the webinars in our series uh, you can register by going to our website. Um, just on our landing page, our homepage, uh, they're in a bar on the right for like upcoming webinars and training opportunities. So you can find them all right there. You can register for all of them if you want to. So um, thanks again. My name is Jesse Corcoran. If you have any um, feedback about uh, our series or 
Um, or if you just have some prevention related questions, um, feel free to reach out to me. My email is jessic, J E S S I C, at wakasa.org. And that concludes our webinar. So thanks everyone for joining us. I hope you have a great day.